We begin tonight with the stunning collapse in Afghanistan. The stunning collapse of Afghanistan. The stunning collapse of Afghanistan. The stunning collapse of Afghanistan. Stunning collapse. A stunning collapse. Stunning collapse, and stunning is the word here. The stunning collapse of Afghanistan after two decades of falling apart marks the end of a grand American experiment in nation building. It's an experiment that Americans, Afghans, and a lot of other people will be paying for for a long time to come. But if you think that means the end of America's forever wars, think again. Here's why. Way back in the year 2000, this guy, ran for president campaigning against a thing called nation building. I just don't think it's the role of the United States to walk into a country and say, we do it this way, so should you. Maybe I'm missing something here. I mean, we're gonna have kind of a nation building core from America? Absolutely not. But life comes at you fast. And that same president took a very different view after 9-11. He went on to launch two of the longest wars in US history. So long, they became known as forever wars along with the wildest experiment in nation building America's ever tried in Afghanistan. Which, again, was the 180 degree opposite of what Bush just spent an entire presidential campaign telling us the military was for. Our military is meant to fight and win war. That's what it's meant to do. And when it gets overextended, morale drops. But I'm gonna be judicious as to how to use the military. It needs to be in our vital interest, the mission needs to be clear, and the exit strategy obvious. And that contradiction, has become a curious tradition of U.S. foreign policy. Denounce nation building as a hopeless dream, then go ahead and take a swing at it anyway. Afghanistan is hardly the only country where America has struggled to set up a friendly proxy government with a military that could keep America's local enemies at bay, and it's hardly the only failure. In South Vietnam, the local government held out for two years after America forces bailed. The U.S. withdrew from Somalia in 1993 after the first bout of really serious resistance. On the campaign trail in 2000, George W. Bush blasted his predecessor, Bill Clinton, for attempting to nation build in Haiti. Then, in 2004, Bush sent U.S. troops right back in there to restore order after his administration had orchestrated the removal of Haiti's then president. Oh yeah, right after he invaded Iraq, with a promise to build democracy there too. The withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 left the power vacuum filled by ISIS, which prompted American troops to surge right back in there again in 2014 and yes, the U.S. still has 2,500 troops in Iraq today. Getting out of Afghanistan was one thing Biden and former President Trump actually agreed on. It's long past time we end the forever wars. Endless, ridiculous foreign wars. I've long argued that we should bring home the vast majority of our combat troops. I want to get out of these endless wars. I campaigned on that. I want to get out. We've been in Afghanistan for 19 years. It's time to end America's longest war. 19 years in Afghanistan. I think that's enough. In February 2020, Trump announced a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban, agreeing to withdraw thousands of troops by mid-July, and, if other conditions were met, a complete pullout by May this year. But the Afghan government wasn't part of this deal, and its own negotiations with the Taliban, known as the intra-Afghan talks, weren't really getting anywhere. Lots of people knew the Afghan government could collapse in as little as just a few months. But the real shocker was seeing it fall even faster than the skeptics had warned, or than U.S. intelligence reportedly thought possible. Less than one week before the Taliban takeover, the U.S. Embassy in Kabul was tweeting optimistic shit like this about the intra-Afghan talks. به من داشتن آزادی برای آموختن نه تنها از لحاظ امنیتی بلکه از لحاظ اقتصاد و سیاست و پیام من به گروه مذاکره کنندگان این است که در بخش تعلیم و تربیت توجه بیشتر داشته باشد #peacemonday now that same embassy has shredded its paperwork for safety reasons and been totally evacuated after nearly 20 years there were roughly 240,000 deaths directly resulting from the war in Afghanistan which spilled into Pakistan and so that includes more than 6,000 U.S. service members and contractors, more than 24,000 Pakistani civilians, and more than 47,000 Afghan civilians. The economic cost to the U.S. will be calculated for years to come. Brown University's Cost of War project estimates a bill of $2.26 trillion, 
And that's not counting future cost of veterans care or interest payments for money borrowed to fund the war. And let's not forget, over $80 billion for a 300,000 strong Afghan army which pretty much went poof overnight. The Taliban had such an easy stroll into Kabul, they seemingly had time to stop and check out a theme park in Herat while they were taking over the country. <laughs> Biden says that the speed of the collapse is just one more reason to believe this whole thing was never gonna work. So we might as well get the hell out now. He aligned his administration with the same positions George W. Bush staked out 20 years ago on the campaign trail. I don't think our troops ought to be used for what's called nation building. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralized democracy. Instead, he promised to double down on anti-terror operations that don't involve putting a lot of American boots on the ground in places like Somalia, Syria, and other hotspots across Africa and Asia. We conduct effective counterterrorism missions against terrorist groups in multiple countries where we don't have permanent military presence. You thinking what I'm thinking? Yep, more drone strikes. Luckily, shooting missiles out of flying robots is totally uncontroversial and has never ever misfired or killed any civilians. But the best part, from Washington's point of view, is that it's really hard for the rest of us to track. And Trump made it even harder than it was before. During his term, the US ramped up drone strikes in countries where it's not officially at war, like Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan. And in 2019, he revoked an Obama-era rule requiring US intelligence officials to publicly disclose how many civilians were killed by drone strikes outside war zones. When Biden took over, he imposed new temporary limitations on airstrikes outside actual war zones, meaning the White House needs to sign off on every strike, pending a review of the Trump-era rules. But after Kabul fell, he sure didn't sound like the US is about to stop using drones anytime soon. We've developed counterterrorism over the horizon capability that will allow us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the direct threats to the United States in the region, and act quickly and decisively if needed. This approach might be less headline-grabbing than invading an entire country and holding on to its territory for a generation. But the consequences are damn real. As many as 16,900 people have been killed in U.S. drone strikes and other covert operations since 2004 in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan, including up to 2,200 civilians. In other words, ending the land invasion phase of this forever war doesn't mean the next stage is peace. It's probably more like Forever War 2.0. Forever War, the sequel, part two, the reboot, two forever, two war. And it doesn't make a difference that this wasn't the original plan, whatever that was exactly. Once these things get going, they are damn hard to stop. As Bush's Secretary of State Colin Powell put it, no battle plan survives first contact with a real enemy. Or, to quote Mike Tyson, Everyone has a plan, until they get punched in the mouth. At least a boxing match only has 12 rounds. <laughs>